you want to you want to go around the room, the virtual room here, and introduce everybody. Oh, uh, I guess a few of you have actually seen this presentation before, so I've got to thank your gluttons for punishment. Um, I uh, appreciate the opportunity. It's not often that we we get the opportunity to speak to a group that represents is this many cattle. Um, frankly, we uh, or I I especially like to work with large producers as they tend to be a little more serious about their breeding programs. And I suppose they have more on the line, so it, it makes sense that they they would be a little more serious about their breeding programs. Um, you might be wondering, for those of you who haven't seen this presentation, you might be wondering why uh, a picture like this or what a picture like this is doing in a presentation about cows. Uh, this is actually a picture that hung on my bedroom wall while I was growing up. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I grew up in a province of Canada that we call Minnesota, uh, which is uh, quite a ways quite a ways uh, up north, and our, our uh, sport of choice is hockey, and this is the best defenseman to ever play the game of hockey, Bobby Orr of the Boston Bruins, scoring a winning goal uh, in the Stanley Cup, which is equivalent to the World Series. The reason I use this picture is I think it's important that we have goals. Uh, this, I'm a little, I'm frozen up here. Kathy, can you? For some reason, my uh, my mouse is frozen up, but uh, we'll get it unstuck here. What do I need to do? Okay. So as I was saying, it's important to have goals if you're in any. Um, line of work, any any business, uh, and uh, we can all have as beef cattle operators, operations, uh, we can have a number of goals and we can have various goals among us, but one common thread uh, tends to be uh, this goal, at least I would hope we all uh, hold this goal, and that would be increasing profitability. Now there are many ways we can do that. Uh, we can improve our nutrition, uh, we can improve our herd health, we can improve our marketing. There are many ways to increase profitability in a, in a uh, beef cattle operation. Tonight I'm going to focus solely on increasing profitability via genetics. Um, I've got a series of slides that uh, go down a path towards profitability, uh, specifically as I said via genetics. I've kind of broken them into three segments, and as we move through each segment, if you have any questions, just type up and ask them. I think it's best to, to ask them more on the topic rather than waiting until the end. And, and in between these three segments, we'll take a little break, and, and uh, you guys can, can ask any, any question you want at any time, and when we take breaks, uh, some of you may need to do other things, crack a beer or, or go to the bathroom or something along those lines. So, so with that, I'll start out with a slide that I've used in many, many presentations. And I asked the crowd to tell me what the first commandment of uh, beef cattle breeding is. Um, I feel so strongly about this. I think uh, this is the one thing as a beef cattle producer that you can implement that will virtually guarantee to improve your bottom line. And I don't know if there's anything else when it comes to uh, beef cattle production that uh, I can say that about, at least when it comes to beef cattle breeding. And uh, that is, thou shalt crossbreed. If, if you are serious, if you are serious about improving profitability, you absolutely need to be crossbreeding. 
There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So you might wonder how in the world can you make such a statement? How can you be so certain and say something like that without any question? Well, I'm hardly going out on a limb. There is study after study after study that summarizes summarizes the fact that that uh, crossbreeding will improve your bottom line. And Jerry likes to say that uh, if you stacked up the reports about crossbreeding on top of each other, they'd actually reach the ceiling. And you wouldn't find a single report that would conclude that crossbreeding didn't improve your bottom line. So I don't think we're hardly going out on a limb here and saying that if you're serious about improving your profitability, you absolutely need to be crossbreeding. So why is crossbreeding so powerful? What makes crossbreeding so powerful? Well, there are a couple things. And the first one, the one that comes to everyone's mind is this, hybrid vigor. Hybrid vigor is simply the concept of getting that extra boost when we cross unrelated animals, animals of differing breeds. We get this boost in production. We get, in fact, when we, when we look at research, USDA research has established that we can get 30% plus pounds of cow or pounds of calf produced per cow exposed over her lifetime. That's 30% extra or even more. And that, of course, is due to the, the fact that a crossbred cow milks more, it's more productive. Uh, the crossbred calf grows faster. And again, it's damn the crossbred cow lasts longer. She simply lasts longer than a straight bred cow. So when you combine all that, you get 30% more pounds over the lifetime of a cow. And, and a fellow that used to work for us, Marty Roth, I know many of you know him, He'd like to say that if you could give a shot to your herd that would improve production by 30%, you'd run your cows through the, the chute every week. But uh, with crossbreeding, you don't have to do that. You simply have to crossbreed. So what else? What else does crossbreeding bring to the table besides hybrid vigor? Well, it also brings complementarity. Complementarity is just a fancy word for matching strengths with weaknesses. Um, for instance, if you have a herd that is real um, poor for marbling and very good for yield grade, uh, you find you match that herd with the sire, uh, that is vice versa, that is complementarity. Can you do that within a breed? Certainly, you can tap into complementarity within a breed but you're much more limited when you stay within a breed. Uh, when you crossbreed, if you need to improve a trade, if you need to improve marbling, you can use the entire gene pool. The entire gene pool is available to you, so that really stretches out your genetic reach. Um, so crossbreeding brings these two things, hybrid vigor and complementarity, and the, the combination of the two are very, very powerful. So you'd certainly think that uh, given the fact that we've established, science has established for many, many decades, many decades, that crossbreeding will improve your bottom line and we know exactly why, you'd certainly think that all the animals in, in the, our population would be crossbred. You can certainly say that about the, the pig industry, at least a good share of the pig industry and the poultry industry. The, the competing meat animal species, uh, virtually all of the animals in those populations are crossbred. And we'd certainly think that would be the case in the beef cattle population, but this is a fairly good depiction of where we're at when it comes to crossbreeding in our industry. We basically have our head in the sand. We have our head in the sand when it comes to crossbreeding. So the million dollar question is why is that? Why are we burning money? Why when we know crossbreeding will improve profitability, why are we not using it? I saw a statistic that showed that half estimated that 
half of the cows in this country are straight bred cows. Half of the beef cows in this country are straight bred cows. And that is just amazing that after all we know that we would see that kind of st statistic. And there can be many reasons behind that. Um, and I'm sure uh, the one I'm going to pose is not the only one. But I think when it comes to the methodology we have su suggested for cross-breeding, we've really dropped the ball. That's uh, Adrian Peterson, my favorite running back, dropping the ball there in the championship game last year. And when I say we, I'm talking about breed associations, universities, extension services have dropped the ball, and this is what we've done. We've anointed this type of crossbreeding system, rotational crossbreeding, as the system of choice when it comes to implementing crossbreeding in beef cattle. And you've all seen this kind of crossbreeding in, in the textbooks. Uh, it involves straight bred sires, and, and you take the straight bred sire and breed them to um, a group of cows or a group of females that are uh, have low levels of relationship to that breed, and, and then you go around the rotation. And this example, I'm showing you a three breed rotation. Well, what's the problem with that? What's the problem with a rotational crossbreeding system? Well, the first one is this. It's difficult, if not impossible, to implement. It is, if you have a small herd, you can say it's impossible to implement. If you have 20 or 30 cows, how in the world do you pull off a rotational crossbreeding system? You just can't, you just can't do it. It becomes impossible. Even if you have a large herd, it's so cumbersome, you've got to manage these separate breeding herds. And most producers, most beef cattle producers, are just not willing, they're just not willing to manage that kind of overhead and take on that kind of extra, extra hassle. So it's impossible to implement. Here. If, not, if, if not impossible, it's very difficult. Secondly, if you, if you do it correctly, you either you end up with inconsistency or less than optimal complementarity. And the reason I say that is because after each one of these straight bred sires breeds its group of cows, you end up with high percentage of that particular breed. Well, that's fine if all of those breeds are biologically the same for all the traits of importance, if they're the same mature size, if they're the same milk production level, if they're the same marbling level, if they're the same yield level, then you don't have a problem with uniformity. But then you really haven't tapped into complementarity. Because remember, complementarity is matching strengths to weaknesses. And if you're using biological types that are all identical, you have not tapped into complementarity to its fullest. So those are two reasons that make rotational crossbreeding not very desirable. Yet this is the type of crossbreeding in beef cattle that we've actually anointed. And I think a lot of it has to go to breed associations. Breed associations for years have been telling producers that if it's not, if it's not purebred, if an animal isn't purebred, it isn't seed stock. So that's kind of fed into the psyches of, of uh, beef cattle producers and really fed into this, this idea that we, we need to use straight bred sires and use rotational crossbreeding to introduce crossbreeding into our systems. So is there a better way? Can we do something? Can we, can we do better when it comes to crossbreeding? Is there an ideal system? Well, that ideal system would do this. It would deliver hybrid vigor. We, of course, need to deliver hybrid vigor if we want to get our punch out of crossbreeding. But at the same time, we want to deliver this complementarity, do it in a consistent fashion. So we need hybrid vigor, complementarity with consistency, and maybe first and foremost, it needs to be simple. It needs to be simple. It's easy to turn out a bunch of Angus bulls. You just buy a bunch of Angus bulls, turn them out. You keep doing that year after year after year. That's easy. That's very easy to do. And it's also very appealing. That ease of implementation is extremely appealing. 
So what's the solution? Well, many of you sitting there probably are aware of where I'm going here, and where I'm going is, is to the composite seed stock concept. What do composites do? Well, composites are really, they're just simply crossbred seed stock. They're a fancy word for crossbred seed stock. What do they do? Well, they deliver hybrid vigor, and they deliver complementarity in a consistent, simple to use package. Jerry likes to say, it's all in there. It's like ragu, you just screw off the top and you pour it in. And when I say, when I say delivering complementarity with consistency, I like to use an example to explain that. The reason, the reason you can gain complementarity with consistency with hybrids is that the breed proportion stays fixed. So for example, if you wanted to use if you wanted to use Jersey, say you feel 25% Jer Jersey is warranted in your operation for whatever reason. You know, they, they marble well, they calve easy, they mop a lot. So you think 25% Jersey is where you want it. Under a rotational crossbreeding system, you'd use a purebred Jersey bull and you'd end up with high percentage Jersey females and high percentage Jersey steers. Well, you don't want that. You want 25%. With a composite, you can set the composite at 25% Jersey and stick with that. And that way you can maintain complementarity. You can use a bull as extreme as a Jersey, extreme, different biological type, and yet you can maintain a consistent, uniform cow herd and animals in the feedlot. So with that, that's the the end of the first segment, anybody have questions uh, about that? If not, we'll, we'll move on. Most everybody, I'm assuming, is a, is a strong believer in crossbreeding. We generally, it is, it is quite uh, encouraging over the last, oh, I'd say the last few years, uh, there have been a lot of converts to crossbreeding, and it seems to really be picking up steam. Well, actually, the research, USDA research, shows it's about a horse apiece. Uh, the only one area you actually gain uniformity when you're comparing composites, a stabilized composite versus a, a straight bred herd is in the area of reproduction. Uh, if, you look at, if you look at over a period of time, if you look at uh, uh, something like pregnancy rates in straight bred herds versus uh, composite herds, you will see much more consistency in pregnancy rates over years because Composites can take fluctuation in environment. Straight breads really struggle with that. If you have a real great year, straight bred herds can almost size up with uh, crossbred females as far as fertility. You get a rougher year, that's when you see a big difference. The straight breads will continue uh, to show high levels of, of fertility, where, where crossbreds will continue to show uh, high levels of fertility. And, and straight breads will, will drop off dramatically. But in other traits, uh, generally the uniformity for the, the other traits that we, we typically size up in beef cattle production, birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight, it's about a horse apiece. What about perfect traits? Yeah, so same thing. Same thing. Now, USDA shows that, that the, the uniformity in a stabilized composite is equal to the uniformity in, in a straight bed. Wait, Well, 
Well, I, I, that's one thing. I think there are several factors, and you know, we could go on, you know, quite a while talking about all the factors. I think that's a big one, though. I think breed associations have spent a long time building this paradigm that in order to be seed stock, it's got to be purebred. And of course, that helps sell registration papers and you know all the things that go on in, in the field, of the show ring. That was always a big deal too in the show ring. And you know, of course, there are other things like certified Angus beef. I'm sure that had a fair bit of influence on on uh, people straight breeding, uh, going to straight breeding in in uh, beef cattle production. Although you know, the irony is you can have sort of you can hit certified Angus beef specifications without even having Angus. You know, anymore, most seed stock is black hided, and you simply have to meet average choice, and and you hit certified Angus beef. And I'm sure you know we could speculate about several other reasons why composites haven't caught on, but for some reason there's quite a disparity between the pig and the poultry industry, that's all their seed stock is composite. Um, and even if they keep any straight lines, they're just kept to develop composite lines. That's their sole purpose. When they go out into a commercial production setting, they're selling crossbred boars and, and crossbred, crossbred roosters, I suspect. Um, so it's for some reason there is a is a disparity between us and you know, beef cattle and the meat animal species we compete with. Anybody else have any other theories? Somewhere we went off track. But we need to need to get back on the tracks. So so let's uh We'll move on to the next section. Um, now I think I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir when I when I talk about crossbreeding. Uh, generally, people that uh, make uh, make a living from the beef cattle business, uh, you tend to see a lot higher proportion, I think, of them crossbreed. Uh, but if we're going to crossbreed, if we accept that crossbreeding will improve our bottom line, well, the next question becomes, well, which breeds do we use? Well, fortunately for us in the U.S., we have the USDA Meat Animal Research Center, and they have some of the best geneticists in the world working there, and they've done what we call germplasm um, research for a number of years. And what Meat Animal Research says, and they've compared virtually every breed that you can think of at the Meat Animal Research Center. Uh, what they say, um, their consistent statement is this, that the genetic potential for yield rate, marbling, and carcass weight are optimized in cattle with the 50-50 British Continental Ratio. And what are they saying? Well, what they're saying is that generally British cattle are superior in marbling, or at least the Angus-based British cattle are superior in marbling. And continental cattle are superior for yield rate. And when you combine them, you get very close to optimal. Now obviously, depending on your operation and your marketing system, you can veer from that 50-50 one way or another. If you're shooting at a higher quality market, you maybe have a little more um, um, British in there, and if you're wanting a, a higher or better yielding product, you shoot for a little more continental. But that 50-50 has been something that USDA has suggested uh, this year, and you can go all the way back to the very beginning uh, when they've been doing the germplasm evaluation all the way to 1973, and they've been suggesting this British continental. And, and the thing about the reason this is so critical is that carcass traits are traits you don't get much hybrid vigor. You get very little to no hybrid vigor in carcass traits. So it's critical to tap into complementarity. In other traits, for instance, fertility, 
Heck, you can use most any breed. Doesn't matter if they're British, continental, actually generally kind of poor fertility, high fertility. When you cross those breeds, you get a nuclear explosion. I mean, that hybrid vigor, when it comes to reproduction, is so powerful, you get this nuclear explosion no matter what you're crossing. But when it comes to carcass traits, you don't get that. You don't get this, this uh, big boost from hybrid vigor. So it's critical. The carcass traits are the critical area you need to make sure you're getting complementarity. And by going with British Continental, uh, high yielding and high marbling cattle, combining the strengths and weaknesses, you really are leveraging that complementarity end of, of crossbreeding. So what's the British choice? If you buy into this 50-50 uh, or somewhere in that neighborhood uh, mix, what's the British choice? Well, the last germplasm report to come out was Report 22. And in Report 22, they said this, that there is a breed out there that ranks first or second for every carcass trait and every production trait. That same breed ranks first or third, I guess, when it comes to percent pregnancy, but, but uh, towards the top of the heap. And again, this is against other British, against their peers, the other British breeds. This particular breed sizes up this way for reproductive traits, cavities, maternal cavities, and so forth. And when it comes to efficiency and weight gain, uh, they size up very strongly as well there against their peers. Well, what is this breed? This breed is the Angus breed. And that's not surprising. It's not surprising, um, well, actually what I should say, it's not surprising that Angus is a dominant breed in this country. When you look at how it sizes up against its peers, how it sizes up against other British breeds, Angus is pretty stout. So we shouldn't, none of us should be surprised that Angus is a dominant breed in this country. I didn't say the dominant breed, I said Angus should be a dominant breed. It warrants it. It's a, it sizes up very well against its peers. So what about continental? What about continental breeds? How do breeds size up against each other when it comes to continental? Well, there's a breed out there that is actually first or second uh, when it comes to carcass traits, uh, slipped into second for retail product, basically yield rate, first across the board and everything else. When it comes to productive traits, uh, first across the board. Uh, when it comes to reproductive traits, uh, sizes right up towards the top in every reproductive trait you measure. And when it comes to the efficiency traits that meat animal research gauges, first across the, the board in that as well. Well, this breed, and when you look at this profile, I think it's fair to conclude that this breed sizes up better against its peers. This continental breed sizes up better against its peers than the Angus breed does against its peers. And what is that breed? Well, it's Semico. Now, I would be the first to admit, some of you, when you see that, you're probably wondering, how in the world can that be? I had Semico. Semico were hard calving. They were big cattle. The cows ate me out of house and home, um, put them in the feedlot. They didn't grade. They just were not desirable cattle. I cannot imagine that they size up the way they do. Well, I'll be the first to tell you that 15 or 20 years ago, if we would have showed this slide to, to you 15 or 20 years ago, if we would have showed the results from the USDA uh, Meat Animal Research Report two decades, two decades ago, it would have been embarrassing. Semitol did not size up well. Semitol did not deliver the characteristics that the commercial cattlemen needed. And that's an absolute fact. So, what's happened? What has changed over the last two decades? Well, I think in a nutshell, there's been an evolution. There's been an evolution in the Semitol breed. And if you talk to people familiar with seed stock in the industry, familiar with breeds in the industry, if you talk to people at USDA, if you talk to anyone that's very in tune with the industry, the seed stock industry, they will tell you Semitol has made more genetic progress than any other breed. Well, how'd that happen? Well, the key is this. 
We took science. We took cutting edge science and we added a membership that was willing to roll up their sleeves. They flat rolled up their sleeves and they did what it took to use that science and make better cattle. And we ended up with this nuclear explosion, this, this tremendous improvement in, this, in a population of cattle that's probably never been seen before. So the key is the science was used by the members and we ended up with with the population or we ended up with an end result that was, was simply phenomenal. So uh, how did that happen? Well, here's some of the science. In order to fuel the engine, genetic evaluation, you can look at genetic evaluation like an engine, but the engine needs fuel to work and that fuel is data. So one of the first things Jerry did, Jerry was a meat scientist at at the uh, University of Missouri. And he no more than got his contract signed. This is the story. Jerry didn't tell me this. I've heard others tell me this story that Jerry no more than got his contract signed. And he was out breeding cows to go into what became the Carcass Merit Project. And the Carcass Merit, all these things have happened over the years. And another fellow came along, Marty Rothwell had mentioned earlier. Jerry hired him fairly soon after Jerry came on board. And those two put together what is now the longest running and largest structured sire testing program in the country. And they weren't just satisfied in testing semitall bulls. They tested bulls of all breeds. Uh, now we'll test bulls. We, we take bulls from several bull studs, from from all about any breed you can think of, we've tested them over the years in the Carcass Merit Project. So that has gone a long way. That has fueled this genetic evaluation engine. Another thing that fueled the engine is this. Yep. Right, right. And, that, and the other thing is this, this is just a site structured sire testing project. We also get data. We get carcass data from breeders. We have, we have very progressive breeders that will put cattle on feed themselves, and we get carcass data that way too. Um, and one of the outgrowths, like Mike is talking about, one of the outgrowths actually of this carcass merit project is that we call it the heifer cattle project. And Jerry got the bright idea many years ago that we should test some of these bulls on British heifers. And what was happening is we were going around, there, was a, uh, there were several breeders, commercial breeders, that we were going in and, and AIing their cows. And, and at the time, it was just mature cows, and we were taking those uh, cattle and putting them on feed. Well, then Jerry got this idea that, well, what if we test the bulls on their British heifers? Of course, uh, 10, 15 years ago, that that probably sounded like crazy talk. Well, uh, they convinced they convinced enough producers that had uh, commercial British heifers, British-based heifers, to do that. And over the years, we have this this project, uh, and also data that comes in from all over the country, from our breeders all over the country, on calving ease, has led to the biggest improvement in calving ease of any breed going. And, and one of the things down on the bottom of that slide, you see that we were the first breed to have a calving ease EPD. A birth weight is a decent indicator of calving ease, but if you really want to make progress in calving ease, you're best off to actually evaluate the trait directly. And we were the first breed to have that calving ease EPD. So uh, combine that this engine that we created where we could calculate calving ease EPDs, combine that with the fuel, with data that's running through the engine, and tremendous progress was made. And the other thing, the other major scientific event was we were the first breed to have multi-breed genetic evaluation. And that was all the way back in 1997. A couple of scientists from Cornell who we worked with for over two decades rolled out the first multi-breed genetic evaluation. And that allowed us to evaluate 
all of the crossbred cattle. We could evaluate on the same playing field all the breeds we have represented in our database. And believe me, we have virtually every breed out there represented in our database and all the breed combinations. In fact, up until a little while ago, we had six million animals in our database. And it's only recently, now you hear a lot of talk about multi-breed genetic evaluation. It's become in vogue and other breeds are uh, striving to have that, but we had that back in 1997. Just recently, the Red Angus breed uh, came to us uh, wanting us to calculate uh, multi-breed EPDs for them, and we do it the way we always do. We combine databases. We added their data to ours. We had a little more than 6 million. They had a little less than 3 million. Now we have over 9 million animals in our database, and that's the fuel. We have 9 million high octane. We've got a high octane uh, a gasoline going through our genetic evaluation system. So what's the end result? What has happened? Well, I put this, this is on, this is on a standardized scale, so we can look at the lines and compare one against the other, and you can tell where we've placed more of our selection pressure. If you look at that, that top line, that blue line, you will see that we have made the most progress in cavities. As I said, uh, we have made more progress in cavities than, than any other breed. Now, in fairness, we probably needed to make more progress in cavities than any other breed, or at least in many breeds, certainly more than the, the British breeds, and we have done that. If you look at the, the line just below that, that purple line, uh, that's yearling weight. Uh, at the same time we've improved calving ease, we've also increased yearling weight. We've also increased growth. Now we haven't increased growth as rapidly as some other breeds, specifically the, the Angus breed and, and other British breeds, but then again, we probably didn't need to increase growth as much as those other breeds. We needed to increase calving ease. Uh, we had a lot of growth, and, and uh, we still have continued to improve growth over all that time while we we're improving calving ease. The next, the next that curved line, it's kind of a brown-looking line, that's stability. That's, that's a prediction of the longevity of a semitall female in the herd. You can see We've made a fair bit of progress in that uh, over the 30-some the, uh, uh, years. And then uh, the MW mature weight, that green line, uh, you can see we peaked in mature weight in the early 90s, and we've dropped back since then. And we are now, when it comes to mature size, and this is, this is a hard paradigm to, to adjust to, but USDA... Um, just recently weighed up their mature females, and they have concluded that Herford and Angus are actually slightly larger at maturity than Senefal is now. And that was actually published uh, just a while back. And, and as I said, that's a, that's a, uh, a paradigm that uh, is a hard, hard pill to swallow, I know, for the, the British breeds to actually realize that that they are bigger mature-wise than, than Semitol. And then marbling, you can see we bottomed out. The, the red line is marbling. We bottomed out marbling in the early 90s. And since that point in time, uh, we've probably increased marbling as much as any trait we've swept before uh, from the early 90s on. But in the early years, we really, as I said, you know, 20 years ago, uh, we were really not offering a a good product for the commercial cattle. So with that, any any questions or comments or you guys run out of beer there or something? No, I've got one one more segment. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. What? Mature weight on on the British breeds versus the 
I don't. I don't know the absolute um, magnitude. I do know, I mean, they were very close to each other. Statistically, you could probably say there was no difference, but but actually, I mean, Mike or Jerry, you might remember the the publication, but it seemed like there were maybe the Hereford and Angus were 20 pounds heavier somewhere in that neighborhood. Is that, is that about right? The point down number is what I remember being the, the maximum difference. Yeah. And was it was Hereford actually a little bigger than Angus? Was that was that what they concluded? I can't remember. But uh, Yeah, we can probably send it out. We've got that uh, the email link, so we can probably just blast it out to everybody if you want to, want to read that. But as I said, that was uh, that's kind of a big pill to swallow. But when you select as extreme as when you look at the British breeds, they have put so much selection pressure on growth. Um, you're inevitably going to going to end up with uh, you know some increase in mature size, and that's of course what's happened. And of course that also means an increase in maintenance requirements. And, and they've also when you, when you look at the trends, the trends in Angus and and even Hereford for milk production, that's almost straight up too. And when you combine that with larger mature size, I think you're going to end up seeing that you know the maintenance requirements on those kind of cows. Is, going to be pretty sizable. So the last segment here, I've got one more commandment when it comes to beef cattle breeding and, and that's uh, this concept of selecting a superior sire. I think that's a little easier said than done. When it comes to crossbreeding, that's pretty straightforward. And, and if you're using a rotational crossbreeding system that works for you, I'm not going to say that you need to stop, but but composites certainly offer a real logical way to crossbreed, um, but it's just a matter of selecting whatever composite works for you and sticking with it. When it comes to selecting a superior sire, uh, there are a lot of nuances that you need to deal with. And one of the first is this. I liken cattle breeding to a poker game. And if you played poker, if you go down to one of the casinos, you know that the house has a, a deck, a big stack of cards with several decks in it. And they've laid out hands around the table and, and uh, some of the cards are turned down and some of the cards are turned up and you're sitting at the table and trying to kind of guess what is in each one of these hands. Well, that's a lot like trying to determine what a sire is. And when you have a low accuracy sire, a young sire, where you don't have a lot of accuracy on what that, that sire is genetically, uh, that's like having a hand where you don't have many cards turned up. You might have just one card turned up. You don't really know what's under the rest of those cards. And when you move to a high accuracy AI sire, where they've got thousands of progeny, you're basically laying those cards face up. You know exactly what that sire is. You can see every single card in that sire's hands. Now there's two ways to play poker. You can play poker like the Rain Man, where you actually count every card and you've got a huge advantage. If you play poker like the Rain Man, you've got a big advantage when it comes to, to winning in a poker game. Or you can play poker like I do, that being an Elmer Fudd approach. Well, the analogy would be if you're the if you want to be the rain man when it comes to cattle breeding, you need to use EPDs. You absolutely need to use EPDs. If you want to be like Elmer Fudd, use anything else. Use ratios, use adjusted measurements, use actual weights. That is the difference. When you're using EPDs, you're leveraging every bit and piece of information we have, putting it in 
the, the correct statistical methodology, churning it through that genetic evaluation engine, and you're going to get the best estimate you can possibly get for whatever trait you're interested in. So if you're interested in a single trait, there's nothing, there's no better estimate than that EPD. And if you use anything else, you're actually just clouding the water because it's already in there. All the, the adjusted weights and ratios and all that kind of stuff is factored into the EPD and we've got nine million animals and we take everything into consideration uh, when we're calculating those EPDs and you can have no better estimate than those EPDs. So if I can't say any more strongly than if you want to determine an animal's genetic level, use an EPD. Well, I, I would say it's when it comes to animal breeding in the science of animal breeding, it's as it's as accepted. I don't know that there's as much you know, crossbreeding research goes back. EPDs have been around since the mid-80s. Crossbreeding goes back, I don't know, and Jerry, you're the, you're the oldest one on the call. How far back does crossbreeding go? <laughs> you can dare say it's a long time, but, but both of those are just accepted as fact. If, if you want to predict an animal's genetic level, EPDs are by far your best tool. Um, if you want to improve your bottom line, you know, crossbreeding is, there's no question that crossbreeding will do that. Oh yes, yep. Yep, there's no doubt about it. So, so the gauging genetic level, and when we talk about genetic level, we're generally talking about a single trait. And what we're trying to do, we go to a bull sale, and this is this would be typical of the information available to you at a bull sale. You generally have, or in most cases, you have all the performance data. You've got the actual weights and the adjusted weights and the ratios, and that's all in there. Everything, and that's kind of I call that the residual effect of many years of performance testing. Because remember, in the early years, we didn't have EPDs. We just had, we started out and we just took an actual measurement and that's all we had. And then we thought, well, we can adjust that measurement and do a better job. And then we thought, well, we can compare cattle across contemporary groups and herds if we use ratios and so forth. So that, that's all still in a wholesale catalog. But if we evolve to the point where we get rid of that, we say, okay, we've moved past that. We're going to go to EPDs. We're going to use EPDs to determine what the genetic level is for, a, for an animal for a particular trait. And again, it's, it's just like composites, it's in there. The, with EPDs, all that information is synthesized and it's in the EPD. So again, if you want to predict genetic level, use the EPD. So that said, the next question becomes, okay, I can buy that EPDs are the best predictor we have of the animal's genetic level, but I've got a pile of them. A lot of, a lot of breeds have 15, 20, even up to 25 EPDs. So even if I narrow my focus to those EPDs, even if I can push aside all the extraneous information, focus on the EPDs, how do I make the, the decision, the best decision with all of these EPDs? Because we know the measure of an animal isn't a single trait, it's how they size up in all traits, right? So what do we do? You know, it's very confusing. You scratch your head, you go to a bull sale, even if you zero in on EPDs, there's a lot of them. So what do we do? Well, we got to chart a direction. We have to chart a direction. And here's what we've done in the past. In the past, cow-calf producers, seed stock producers, the direction we have generally taken is to select for more output. Oh, it's, it's, uh, the, the concept is select for more growth and more milk and more of everything. 
well, is that going to get us where we want to go? And I use this example, and I've used it over and over, but we know we can put more fertilizer on a field of corn, and we'll get more corn. We'll produce more corn. We'll get a higher yield. But that, does that make us more money? Does that make us more profitable? Well, only if the extra, the extra cost of producing more fertilizer outweighs, is outweighed by the extra, extra yield. And that's not always the case. So if we focus solely on output, if we're just fixated on output, in my, in my opinion, that is, we have been guilty of that in our industry. We have focused on output. And if we do that, we can get to places, focusing on output can get us to places where we don't want to go. And I think we all can think of several examples of that. Uh, we can see breeds that have gone that direction, uh, frankly. Semitol breed back in the 90s, back in the early 90s went that direction. And I can see other breeds even, I won't mention them, but I can see other breeds um, going down that path even now. So is there a better way to do that? Is there a better way to chart a direction? Well, I think this is infinitely better. If we select for profit, if we chart a direction, if the direction is profit driven, what do we end up with? Well, we end up with more money. If that's our goal, if our goal ultimately, like I said at the beginning of the conversation, we want to increase profitability. So if that's our goal, we are infinitely better off, or we much better, I don't know that infinitely is the right word, we are much better off if we, rather than focus on output, focus on profit. So how do we do that? How do we select for profit? Well, that takes a bit of a paradigm shift. That takes a bit of a paradigm shift. But one thing we know that if we want to change something through selection, we have to do this. We have to measure it. And that it's just as true in profit as it is in, in weaning weight or in marble. We need to measure it. We need to measure the trait. We look at it as a trait and we need to measure it. Well now we all know, you know, how to measure birth weights. We take the sling and put the calf on there and the cow crawls over our back and you know that's all part of, of measuring that trait or running calf across the scale at weaning. We know how to measure biological traits, but this is a little bit outside of our comfort zone maybe. But it really shouldn't be. It's fairly straightforward. If we think like an accountant, profit is simply that. We need dollars of output minus dollars of input, and that gives us profit. And that's actually fairly straightforward. It's not quite as simple as, as weighing a calf or, or uh, uh, running an ultrasound machine across an animal in the chute, but it, it does get us to where we need to go, and that is a calculation of profit. We need to measure that trade. Well, in the world of animal breeding, um, what I'm referring to is actually called an economic selection index. And that is where we're actually measuring profit. I like to call it genetic accounting. It really is no more than that. It's genetic accounting. And a few years back, about five years ago actually, working with a USDA geneticist, Mike McNeil, he's from Fort Keel, Miles City, uh, Montana, uh, we developed two economic selection indexes, an all-purpose index and a terminal index. The all-purpose index is an index you would use to select a sire that's going to be used in the integrated system where you're keeping replacement females, the call animals, the steers, and the call females are going to go into the feedlot, and they're going to be sold grade yield. The terminal index is the index you would use for a sire that you're going to use only on your mature cows, and all the cattle are going to go into the feedlot. And I, you see cattle facts and also acknowledge cattle facts. In order to calculate profit, we not only need the biological predictions, which is what EPDs do. EPDs predict differences in biological traits. We have to tie those biological traits to prices and costs. 
So we're projecting prices and costs for things like pasture and corn and choice to select spread and over and underweight carcass discounts and everything you would need if you were an account. If you want to calculate profit in an integrated system, you need all those things. So we round up all those things and cattle tax provides us with a good share of the prices and costs we use in our indexes. Now you might be sitting there thinking, well, that all sounds kind of nice, you know, that's, that's a technology that might have some merit someday. You know, I've just kind of recently heard about it, uh, and generally when it comes to technology, I, I feel more comfortable just kind of sitting back on my heels and letting my neighbor test it out. And that kind of a philosophy, I think, is in, in most cases not far off. And a lot of times, new technology comes along and the early adopters get stung with it. So, yes, you're better off if it's new technology to maybe sit back a while and see if it actually works. Well, the fact of the matter is, this is not new technology. Uh, this technology was first proposed back in 1943 by a guy from Iowa State University. Uh, named Lenoy Hazel. And since that time, the poultry industry, within the decade of that theory, his, his theory came out in a paper back in 1943, Economic Selection Index Theory, and he, he laid out the whole the mathematics behind his, basically his genetic accounting is what he did. Within that first decade, the poultry industry was already leveraging the economic selection index. Then, a while later, the pig industry came along and used the same technology and the dairy industry followed suit. And now I think it would be fair to say that most all chickens and pigs and virtually all dairy cattle are bred through the use of an economic index. So really in this game, we are quite a ways behind our competitors. We know the technology works. Um, it's been, uh, it was introduced back in 1943. The, spe the species we compete with have used it heavily uh, for years and years. So when it comes to technology, this is not new technology. And I guess I would encourage anybody that is making sire selection to use these indexes. So with that, that uh, kind of covers the, the uh, slides I have. If anybody has questions, just fire them off. Well, I think they are, I mean, they're, they're moving right now, um, Igenity is working with Angus, and they have developed a panel that has some merit. And really, all they are, they're nothing magic. One thing, I think one notion that people need to get past is that there's something magic in a genomic panel. A genomic panel just brings more information, can potentially bring more information to the table to make an EPD more accurate. So, for instance, if you have a young animal, you don't have much of any information on it, and if you add that information to the mix, and that's really the only way to use it. Um, to use it separate from an EPD to, to say, I've got the results of a panel sitting over here, on the same animal I have an EPD and somehow I'm going to jockey around uh, going to jockey around to uh, make a decision it's not an effective way to use that information that information needs to be incorporated into the EPD just like we would incorporate all the records and measurements you know the birth weights and the weaning weights and the ultrasound measurements that all needs to be in the mix and it will Yes, it, it can increase the accuracy of an ETD, but right now, 
Angus is the only breed where they have a panel that is developed to the point where it really has much utility. And I guess somebody, anybody else? Jerry fall asleep? Yeah, I can hear you, Jerry, but I can't hear Mike very well.
impact, okay. But, but you know, and I guess one of the things that I see is, and it gets back to what Dylan was saying before, we keep you on your left, you know, that you have a problem standpoint, uh, you know, I was in a, a, a producer's meeting in Baptist last year, but, you know, we have guys from Step Fires and Step Lots and all that, and that's not that they're saying, you know, we need to have more, more uniformity and all that sort of stuff uh, for you to produce your And uh, my question, Joe, you know, was, well, if you want more uniformity, we need to have data coming back showing what we're screwing up, you know, what we need to improve and what we need you know, what we're doing well and what we're not, and I'm not getting, you know, I talked to a couple of buyers, you know, I had a couple of buyers come up to me afterwards, and, and they said, you know, that's a really good question, and, and now that you're going to be playing hell trying to get, get that type of information, even if you're using that, you know, a, 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 some sort of EID program or anything like that, because there's a lot of, uh, you know, from a lab standpoint, if they start telling you that, or, or if a, a, a I'm not trying to 
I'm not trying to smash on the guy on the on the uh, on the table or anything like that. You know, there's uh, there's you know, I've got a couple of guys that are you know weighing whether or not they want to carry their gas through yearly and then sell them or or hold them or or just sell them right now. You know, because that's a that's a huge risk on uh, on their part, just like it's a huge risk on the on the big on the people of course. I'm just saying that that uh, to me it seems like uh, you know that in the industry as a whole that there is there there are certain there's when it goes from cow cap producer to the buyer, the feed on finisher, you know, to find figure out some of that yield grade it is that we do the industry it's like we kind of film all each other a little bit. We need to do a better job of having these cooperation here. And do it stuff like tonight, I think really helps that stuff out. Because that's been my experience in the past as far as trying you know, trying to go through and you know, you, as a cow cap producer you're trying to do the right thing, you're trying to do with what what they keep Sean is having them to do, but sometimes, you know, you'll see your neighbor because you're down and pull your cap off off the feed that day, you know, and you know, you spend you know the extra time and money and doing doing a proper weaning and doing a uh, put you know putting a thirty day wean on those cats, getting them properly vaccinated, you know, and having them unbroken and you know being able to go on on a grain substitution type of deal. You tell that to the to the to the auction yard turn around and you don't have to care, you know, your neighbors get them up like you are on the on the on the gas your neighbors can pay me. You know, I've got clients that you know they, they get frustrated with that sort of stuff going on and I know it's not necessarily from a, a feedlot uh line problem, but you know, I'm just I'm just telling you from a cow gas producer, some of that stuff you see that going on to try to do that thing and yet it's just be nice. Let me jump, let me keep up here see if we can get Barry and Kathy just for a couple minutes. Barry and Kathy, do you come in here at the mid to sell basement? What can we do for you? What can we, how can we help you be more successful, better, or whatever you'd like from us? So this is all pretty much old hat for you. Thank you. 
I just have a few few more slides, Jerry. To, I just want to show what can actually happen when somebody somebody really puts a pedal to the metal when it comes to profit. And and the slide I'm showing you now shows the well, just the, the breed in general, the, the tremendous progress that's been made over the last 30 years. And you can see the all-purpose index is the one that measures uh, profit if we're looking at an integrated system where you're keeping replacement females and, and over the years, over those 30 years, we've made a fair bit of progress. I think the average of the breed now is about 103 and that is, you can read it like an EPD. Um, so if a bull is 100 and another one's 103, that bull would have, you'd expect three more dollars per exposure. So it's based on per exposure. And, so 103 now is breed average for API, and you can see the terminal index we've increased fairly steadily, not quite as dramatically over the years. And the reason, the reason for that dramatic increase in API is we've, we've uh, decreased the mature size, so dropped our maintenance requirements. Uh, we've uh, improved our calving ease. The longevity of our cows has increased pretty sizably, uh, and marbling has has uh, increased dramatically. And when you put that all together, um, that's pretty appealing or that has a pretty big impact on profit. Now, if we take a look, uh, trying to, we can't move this thing forward. Yeah, 
Yeah, the Angus doesn't really have an equivalent to API. API is a, covers the entire spectrum of the production system, and the Angus the Angus indexes are very segmented. They have a specific segment for the weeding, and they they actually have one specific for maintenance and and feedlot and grid and so forth. But the API is really the the comprehensive index that covers the entire production system. Uh, so it's pretty comprehensive. But you can see now, you take somebody like Mike, who over the years since 2003, uh, looks, you know, he kind of kind of just had a little bit of a, a roller coaster ride there until 2005. And 2005 was the year we rolled out the indexes. And he took to him like a duck to water, and you can see what he's done is his uh, a marbling has gone through the roof. Uh, his yearling weight, he's maintained his growth level, you know, pretty good growth. Uh, his mature weight, the yellow line is mature weight. He's decreased that, and his birth weight. We don't most of Mike's cattle are hybrids or composites, and we don't like he mentioned we don't have a calving he's EPD. So the next closest thing we have is birth weight, and you can see uh, the dramatic drop in birth weight over the years. And you translate that into a profit. He started out in a pretty good position. Back in 2003, he was already higher than the average of the breed. Like I say, right now the breed average is about 103 for API. He was back in 2003, he was about 109. But by really putting the pedal to the metal, he is now above 130, probably approaching 135, and that puts him at the very top. He's at the very top of the breed. Um, we're projecting the average animal at bar CK is at the very top of the breed for API, and it would be very similar for TI. So that's what can happen when you have a breeder that's serious and really utilizes the tools um, they just make tremendous, tremendous progress. And he didn't even pay me to say that. Um, I, I don't know. I didn't, uh, no, I want. I wanted to show. I wanted to show you that he's kind of a show job. His, his niece, uh, JD's daughter, um, showed this at the county fair, and so the cattle are not only profitable, but they're apparently kind of pretty, or at least pretty enough, pretty enough to win a ribbon.
Yeah, and I think that's one thing that too to keep in mind about API because oftentimes when when you hear somebody hears well this index is uh, you use this index if you're going to keep replacement females, but the other part of that is you're also factoring in all of the cull females and all of the steers into the feedlot, so it, it covers the entire gamut. API covers the entire gamut of beef cattle production, so it doesn't ignore the feedlot by any means or the packing plant. That's all factored in there, but it's weighted by the holistic system. It looks at the system as a whole, and it weights the, the value of the animal if it were to go into the, the uh, cow herd, and when the coal animals are going into the feedlot, it, it factors all that in as well. So it's it's a very comprehensive index, and that's the way most people in the beef cattle business. That's the way they use sires. They typically keep replacement females, and the rest of the cattle go into the feedlot, and ultimately hang on the rail. And now, obviously, there are some that uh, are utilizing sires as terminal animals. And that terminal index is perfect for them. But as Mike says, you know, the way he's bred cattle really hasn't lost any ground there either. It's, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure working with Mike because he's, he, uh, he really, it, it's, it's good to see when you create these tools, these scientific tools, it's really rewarding to see somebody that actually uses them. Because too often in, in our industry, you know, people are, they, uh, they don't utilize science, they don't leverage science anywhere near what we do in the other species. But the tools are there, and if people use them, breeders use them, they can make tremendous progress. You know, like, like Barry was talking about, they, they knew 1407 was tremendous way back in the beginning, and, and that was through measuring. You know, when you start measuring cattle, you find you can sift the wheat from the chow. And if you are, if you're serious about it, you can make light years of progress pretty quickly. So I guess anybody have any any other closing comments? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all.